Hi, my name is Brett Slacken. Um, I'm a software engineer at Google. Uh, so I was going to go over kind of about me to kind of frame my uh, perspective here so you can understand where I'm coming from uh, to understand you know, why, what got me into cohort analysis initially. Um, so kind of the journey I've had, I've been at Google for almost seven and a half years now, which is forever. Um, I work on Google Consumer Surveys, which I'll tell you about in a second. Uh, before that, I worked on Google App Engine as an infrastructure engineer. I uh, worked on all different parts of it, uh, helped launch the product, and had a great time. Um, I also worked on PubSub Hubbub, -Hub, which is real-time feeds, uh, real-time RSS. Uh, and then I've also done a bunch of things in the federated social web. So helped out with Webfinger and some of the open OStatus kind of federated uh, open web stuff. So uh, that's kind of my background. Um, my blog is at onebigfluke.com. I'm Hackstore on Twitter. Um, so the product I work on now is called Google Consumer Surveys. If you haven't heard of it, it's a market research platform um, for everyone. Uh, it's five to 10 times cheaper than everything else that's out there. Uh, what we do is we ask people questions on publisher content sites instead of, uh, instead of paywalls. We take those answers and we turn them into market research. So users get free content, don't have to pay for, for content. Researchers get good um, data and publishers get paid. So it's this win, win, win. Um, so on the left, you see on the, the Daily News an example of one of these prompts that we have. And on the right, you see some of the kind of reports we do. So I'm really into data now, like a lot. Uh, statistics and numbers. I wasn't in the past. I was more of like infrastructure organization design kind of person. Uh, but getting into consumer surveys really got me into data and analysis and kind of statistical, statistical significance and all that kind of stuff. Um, so it's a mindset that I got into. And so now, you know, uh, consumer surveys have been out for maybe 10 months. And it's a product that, you know, uh, me and another guy helped start together. And so it's kind of my baby to think about, you know, are we doing well? Is this product doing well? How can we do better? And so on. Um, so it kind of, and our team's kind of structured like a little startup within Google. So it kind of makes me think that way also about the problem. You know, I'm a startup. Maybe I won't be here tomorrow. Uh, how can I execute to make my product better so that customers keep coming back so that I can justify to my investors, which in this case is Google, uh, that we should stick around. So I kinda, that's how we run our, 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 our product. And uh, so anyway, so that's what this kind of was born out of, was the need to make our product successful. Um, cool, okay, so the agenda for today. Uh, so I wanna tell you the goals of this workshop. I want to talk about what's out there already. So kind of a summary of many different types of cohort analysis that exist. Graphs you may or may not have seen in the past. Um, there's a bunch of them. Uh, similarly, uh, so yeah, so what's out there? I want to talk about it in two parts. First is retention, which is what most people think cohort analysis is about. Uh, second is funnel progression, which is, I think, the more interesting thing. Uh, then I'm going to give you a demo of cohort visualizer, which is uh, the tool that I built because of Rick, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, and then just a little kind of conclusion. Uh, okay, so the goals here. These, these are kind of no-brainers, but I really want to emphasize this. Um, here's what I want you to remember. So the first thing you need to do is figure out what metrics matter to you. For consumer surveys, for us, it's you know people buying surveys, users answering questions honestly. Those are the things we care about the most. The ecosystem has to work in order for our product to be successful. Everybody has to win. Uh, so we found that we've looked at a bunch of different metrics, you know, retention rates, uh, repeat buying types of questions. I'll get into some of the details. We found the ones that really actually seem to matter, the ones that, are, that translate into success as we define it. For products that don't necessarily make revenue directly through advertising and so on, or through user engagement or whatever else, it's gonna be different. So you really gotta think about it for you and what, what that means. Um, the second thing is when you take action, you need to measure the impact of the action. If you can't measure whether or not your action was successful or not, then you don't know. That's a really obvious statement, but it's true. So if you're going to do something and your gut tells you that it's going to be better, that's great. Trust your gut. But if you can't measure that it is actually better, then it is not actually better. Uh, and then last is segment your customers. Uh, your customers come in many different types. You have repeat customers, you have high budget customers and low budget customers and oversharers and undersharers. And you, know, you have to think about your customers as different. If you treat them all as one thing, you're not really going to understand how it's working, how it's not. 
Um, and I'll get into that some more. But yeah, those are, those are the big kind of things to keep in mind when you're thinking about cohort analysis. Okay, so let's talk about retention. So retention is this idea of retaining a user. The user stays, keeps using your product. That's good, that's what you want, if, you're, if you have a service especially. Um, uh, retention, so here's the kind of deep thought here though. The reason that retention is useful for, especially for online business, uh, is because it lets you model your business as repeating revenue. That's it. That's the biggest thing. Like, and that seems so simple, but I didn't realize this until I dove into all these stats and pulled it out. Now, if you have a subscription business like a cell phone bill or a monthly music service or something like that, well, it's really easy to, to, to guess how much money you're gonna have next month because you know, because you have a bunch of subscribers. But if you don't have a subscription business, how much money are you gonna make next month? Well, retention is the way of calculating that. Simple as that. How many users are gonna come back to use my service next month? So that's the idea. So retention lets you remodel your business and your revenue or your engagement or whatever, whatever your metric is as a repeating business, repeating revenue business. Uh, okay, now we're gonna go into a lot of charts. So I like data visualizations. Um, I hope you do too. If you didn't, you probably came to the wrong talk. Uh, I'm gonna go over a bunch of these different ones, give you the benefits, pros and cons of each. Uh, at the end, I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna stop for questions about the specific types of charts that are here um, because it can kind of get complicated, but I'm gonna try to dumb these down as much as possible. Okay, so this is probably the chart you think of when you think of retention. This is probably the one you've seen. It's the triangle chart. Uh, it doesn't make any damn sense when you see it the first time. You're like, what is what? Time is going in both axes. Like, I don't understand what this is. So uh, time is going down here. New user signups. There's people who sign up the first week your service started, second week, third week, fourth week, fifth week. The month of their experience into your product is to the right. So if, if your product is seven weeks old, then users in week one have been with the product for seven months. That's why the first row goes all the way out to seven. Users who joined in week seven have only been with the product one week or one month so their retention rate is 100%. Um, okay, so does that make sense? So that's why it's this triangle, because users who joined in week four cannot possibly have been here more than three or four week, uh, months. That's the idea. Um, okay, so now what you can see is on the horizontal, horizontal axis, you get to see your retention rate, uh, compounding retention rate over time. So, or it's not compounding, sorry, in this case. So you see in month one, so week one users, month one, 100% were retained. By the second month, 90% of them are gone. By the third month, 9% uh, of them are gone, and so on. So it's kind of this diminishing decay. Week two users, uh, you can see that 100% uh, again retained in the first month, but in the second month, more of them were retained. So you can see this orange column is the vertical, and it's basically saying, how are, how are my second month users over time changing? Are users coming back? is the experience of new users better such that they wanna continue using my product? So that's what this is trying to highlight. So you can see from top to bottom, it goes 10, 12, 16, 17. So it's increasing in terms of your month two retention, which is a good thing. It means you have more users who are coming back, more of them who are retained. Uh, so that's what this chart is really trying to illustrate. It's trying to show a comparable relative experience of the second month, regardless of what month they signed up. And so again, the, co the cohorts here are the rows, okay? Uh, that's, that's, that's how it's grouped, and then it's the relative experience is the vertical. All right, so let's go over some of the problems of this chart. Um, first of all, it just assumes consistent traffic and behavior. Um, it assumes that people come to your site, they experience your site in the same numbers, they're the same kind of people who convert at the same rate, who are retained in the same way, uh, if you have any kind of PR, um, traffic spikes, if you give people coupons, you're gonna break all of these trends and then this is just gonna look like a triangle of noise. Um, and then by month five, the numbers are really just not useful anymore. They, they start to diverge and there's really no pattern anymore, in, in my experience. Um, now this might not be true for larger services that have very consistent traffic and behavior. But for startups, um, especially if you're being scrappy, you're doing new things every few weeks to promote this and that, and it's just you're not gonna get consistent traffic and, and consistent user behavior. Uh, maybe you pivoted in two months, you know, and you're like, I have a different product than you did before. So this triangle chart's not gonna work for you. Um, okay. 
uh, impact plot. So this is like the triangle plot, except it adds color to show the level of retention. So like the density of the retention. So darker yellow is more retention. Um, OK, so how do you read this? It's, it's pretty overwhelming, um, but it, it, does, it does help you a little bit. So let's say the top, so this is exactly like the triangle chart in terms of the cohorts. Each line is a different cohort. Um, at the very top right of the triangle, you see users who joined in October. Uh, 12 months after they joined, only 26% are left still using your service. Okay. Uh, and some things you can see is around March, 2011 March, there's an 85% retention in month one, 80, 75. So you kind of see this hot spot in there somewhere between February, April, May uh, 2012. But it gets a little bit darker. Um, and maybe that means that the users who happen to sign up then just like really like your service. So if you were using an impact plot to understand what should I do, what I would do is I would look at this and I'd say, OK, what's with that 85%? What's with that dense column? Who are those users? Why did they, why did they show up? Why were they retained? Where did they come from? You know, why were they excited about the product? And why was their retention higher than everyone above and below them? So that's what this is trying to illustrate, hot spots. Uh, the thing is, though, what, what do the hot spots even mean? I mean, it's not even, there's no intuitive sense. Like, if they're really close to each other, uh, what is that? Like, is it, is it just a blip in time? Did you launch a new feature? If it doesn't last, shouldn't it be more like a, everything gets darker after a certain point in time? Um, it's, it's just kind of, it intuitively doesn't like resonate with me. Uh, and then how steep should the gradient be? So it was so hard to see the levels of darkness. And on the stream, you probably can't see it at all. I mean, it's, the yellows are so, you know, not very steep. Um, the other thing is you can only compare clusters to neighboring cohorts. And if you're a startup, let's say that you had, you know, uh, some kind of celebrity tweet about your product in week one, and then nothing for five weeks, and then another person tweeted about it in week five. Maybe those two cohorts have huge retention, and they're actually the most similar, but they're not even close to each other. So you'd see two dark uh, hotspots on the impact graph, but they're not related spatially at all. So again, you can't really understand why intuitively by looking at this graph. So, so okay, this one's like this one's like really complicated. This is a heat map. Um, so this one is. Uh, this, I actually just discovered this a couple days ago. Um, and supposedly, this is what Facebook uses for some of their um, app insights. Um, the level of de data density here is really high, um, which, is, which is great. Um, it's a triangle plot that has been turned 90 degrees to the left. That is what it is. So instead of time going down, time goes to the right. That's good. That's what I'm used to, time going to the right. Uh, up is days past experience. So that's the shared experience. So it's what had been going to the right. Uh, and then the idea is that, of course, month one retention is red. It's, or you know, week one retention is red. It's the bright color at the bottom. And then it would fade to getting cooler towards the top. That's what this tries to do. Uh, these crazy blue diagonal lines are uh, a specific day event. So it's hard to read this. But basically, if you look here, it's, it has January 6th, let's say, is dark blue on the bottom of the graph. And then it continues up in this stair-stepping pattern. And what that is, is that that's January, that's January 6th as experienced by all the other cohorts, which makes sense. So if you count up into the left, the number of days between that blue box to the bottom is the distance that spot is from January 6th. So that's what that's doing. A diagonal is a single day. So in this case, their server was down that day. And so there was no retention on that day for all users on January 6th. And that's why it's blue. OK. Uh, and so here you can see in this plot, um, the retention rates are getting dark, uh, hotter towards the right. They're staying hot for longer. So you can kind of pull out some spatial trends here. Obviously, they've done some things in their products to, inc product to inc uh, increase retention so that it's getting hotter and hotter towards the right side and staying hotter for longer. Um, but it's really overwhelming. Uh, this is a 3D scatter plot. That's really what it is. The x-axis is when they signed up. The y-axis is how long they've been there. And then the color is the, the, the level of their retention. Um, it's, it has all the same clustering problems as the last impact map. Uh, and then 
you know, you can't see rates of change. So how do you know how much your product has changed? How, how much better is it than it was? Like, has your retention improved month over month or second month retention improved by N percent? Like, you really can't read that off of here. Um, but it is really high data density. All right. Uh, okay, this one I call a transistor chart. Um, most people have probably seen this if you've ever looked up cohort analysis. Uh, Fred Wilson had this on his avc.com blog. Um, and this is a graph by RJ Metrics. Uh, and it's trying to do analysis of uh, Twitter, cohort, Twitter cohorts for tweet activity. Um, so the idea here is uh, it's the zero point is average amount of activity. And then the line is percent above or below the average. So the top line here is um, users who signed up in January 2008, or let's say, yeah, January 2008. Month one, they, they are active 180% of normal. Month two, they're 240% of normal. Month three, they're 240% of normal. Month four, they're 300% of normal. Month five, they're back down again. So you can see the shape of the graph uh, and how the user's uh, usage has uh, changed over time. I like this graph because it lets you do clustering that's not spatial. So this chart splits into two sections. The top section where retention is ab above normal, right? More activity than normal, like 1.5% more activity than the average. And then below normal, you know, 75% of normal activity. So you see these two different lines. Uh, I like that because then you can say, well, what happened those weeks? Why are those clustered? Why, why are those the same? And this goes back to my celebrity example. Maybe the people at the top all signed up during a celebrity endorsement, and all the people at the bottom just organically came to your site. This will let you pick that out. And that's, that's, what, that's what's cool about this graph style. Uh, the problem is, you know, it's kind of hard to understand the relationship between the lines. They have the colors don't really make sense. You have to keep looking at the, the legend, then the chart, then the legend, then the chart. Um, but anyway, it overcomes some of the problems of the, of the, of the density map. Uh, and again, so the color of the line is the cohort when they signed up one month ago, two months ago, three months ago. And then the x-axis is their shared experience. So this is the, their month two experience compared to the other person's month two experience and so on. So the cohorts, is, each line is a cohort. Uh, yeah, so again, the problem here, legend chart, legend chart, it hurts my eyes to look at these ones because you keep going like this. Um, again, you can't really read the rate of change because you have to measure the difference between one line and the next line, and that doesn't really make any sense. Uh, it also just gives me flashbacks to when I was studying electrical engineering. Um, this looks like a transistor output characteristic diagram at the bottom left here, if you can see that, uh, where that's the drain, volt, uh, drain current for different levels of voltage. It's like the same exact chart. Anyway. Um, but that's why I call it a transistor chart. Uh, OK. So now here's another one. Uh, and there's two more, I think. So, but I wanted you to see them all. Uh, cycle plot. So OK. Uh, so how many users stick around for a second month of usage? Uh, so this is like a standard uh, you know, retention graph. This would tell you how many stick around for a second month. Um, and then what you can do is for each different cohort, based on when they signed up, you can actually pull out the shape of this. So here are users who signed up. Uh, here are all the month two retentions for the different users. Here are the month three retentions, month four, month five. That's their shared experience. And the last dot is the current retention of that, of that group, or the last retention of that group, depending on how you think about it. And then you can just connect the dots. Isn't that great? So you can say, oh yeah, this is how many are still retained. Here's how many are lost. Uh, I love this plot in theory. I think it's really good. It shows you the comparative shape. You can see the flattening out um, of your retention or the increase or decrease of your retention. Um, I have not been able to pull the data that actually creates this chart from my, from my database. Um, so though it's very pretty, uh, I can't really get the data out yet. Um, uh, but I really want to create one of these. But the thing I've noticed when I've been trying to create one of these charts is uh, the lines never look like this. The lines look like this. They're just this crazy volatile thing. I mean, maybe if you have a very, like I said, a very reliable service that's constantly getting traffic and you have exactly the same functionality every week, it looks like this or it's improving. But for me, it's just up and down and up and down. So then that means that like this plot doesn't make any sense because I would have a line intersecting the other line and it wouldn't work, right? But I like the idea here because it conveys relative shapes and then an overall trend line. Uh, so again, it has a problem of you can't cluster beyond neighboring cohorts. 
Uh, and in practice, yeah, like the cycles are volatile. They're not a consistent trend. All right, so this is the last one from my, my survey of, of uh, cohorts. It's the layer cake. Um, so each color here is when the user joined the service. Uh, and it counts them as active, so they count as one towards their color until they churn, until they stop using the product. And so you can see when they first sign up, a lot of people are active for about a month. Then about the month range, you start seeing this decline. And then at the bottom, you see the layers of cake. These are users who have continued to be retained over time. Uh, and so then if you look at the very far right part of this graph and you look vertically, you see the slices. And you say, OK, here's how many users I have from this month that are active versus last month versus the month before that. And so this is like new versus returning, a nice way of doing that. Uh, you can visualize revenue this way. You can visualize user activity this way. It's many different things. Um, but you really can't pull out uh, comparative retention. So the triangle plots let you compare like month one retention in a vertical. You can't do that with this plot. Uh, and then the ramp effect, those kind of like downward ramps, that's basically only a product of how you define churn. So if you have a 30-day churn, it looks this way. If you have a seven-day churn, it looks that way. If you have a 90-day churn, it looks another way. And that's, so this graph is kind of fudging some things because it depends on how you define churn. Churn being when the user stops using your product, when the customer goes away. So if they show up on your website, and then, they, and then they look at something, and then they never come back, you count, do you count them as churned that day? Do you count them as churned 30 days later, 90 days later? It's really important for you to figure out what that means. Oh, oh OK, hey. Uh, yeah, but it's a, it's a cool graph, because it lets you see um, what percentage of my sales are coming from new users versus returning users. Super easy to read for every month. So easy. OK. So I want to stop for a second um, uh, and see if we have any questions about the graphs I just showed you. Rick, I don't know if you can hook that up. Um, cool. Ah, I see. Uh, all right, what are the most important? OK, so I think the one question so far is, what are the most important metrics when you do core hood analysis? Do you pull in your one key metric and focus on that? I will get to that in just a minute. I think that's a good question. But uh, I, I, was, I just wanted to check for any, like, what, what are you talking about kind of questions um, with, the, uh, with, the, uh, with the cohort graphs I was just showing you. So if you have any of those, please type them in now. If not, I'm going to go back to it. I think, yeah, let's just keep going. OK, I'll stop again for another after this. OK, so that's all retention stuff. That's, that's great. The other thing is funnel progression. Um, so the idea is you know, define your funnel using metrics so you can see how product changes affect new users. Again, very obvious statement. But the funnel is the progression of your users towards what you want them to do. And you need to have metrics that define if that's being successful or not. So for my product, it's users will answer another survey question someday, or they will buy a second survey because they like the surveys I'm selling to them. Uh, for a social network, it's engagement where they continue to do uh, messages, to continue to send messages, or they increase, you know, increase their, their graph size over time, whatever it is. Um, you want to define your funnel using metrics. Um, so this is, the, this is the one that most people define as their funnel metric. Uh, up and to the right, you hear that all the time. Uh, that's a great one. Um, I like that I cite the source of this one. Uh, we've, all, we've all seen this one. Uh, and this is most people's funnel analysis. The funnel is getting bigger. It is. But why? Right? Um, so you should, at a minimum, have this one. How big is your funnel? That's what this question is. Total users ever. Um, OK, here's a dramatic rendering of a funnel. Um, I call it dramatic because it doesn't actually spatially make sense as a visualization. The idea here is each of the colors is a different stage in the funnel, which I'll explain in a second. Uh, they're indicated, uh, they're grouped by cohort, so users who signed up in week one versus week two versus week three. So you can see how it changes over time. And then vertically, it's the least important thing, the the, the, then the most, like more important, more important, and then green is like purchase something, the most important thing. So it's, it's going down. The funnel is, is uh, getting towards the, the tip, right? Uh, so here you can see, in week one, 900 people signed up for the product. 750 downloaded the thing. 380 did a key activity, like something, inviting their friends, I don't know. Uh, and then 95%, 95 actually purchased it. Now the most important thing about this type of 
a funnel analysis is that users go in one bin and only one bin. When they get to the, the last bin purchased, that means they did the other three bins. It's a progression. So, you, so they're mutually exclusive states. And that's how you have to think about your funnel, because that makes a lot of other calculations a lot easier. Um, so that's what this guy's done. He's thought about, OK, here are the four funnel states my users can be in. Here's the progression from one to the next. And here they are in terms of their value and time progression. There's some, there's some caveats to that. Sometimes you can make tricks where one state is always skipped. But that's usually how it works. And then you can compare each different funnel over time. So you can see, oh, look, uh, my key activity metric has gone up as a relative percentage of the rest. So those, three, those orange arrows he's got there for purple, week one, 42% did the key activity. That percentage is uh, of the users who got there. Week two, 50% did that activity. Week three, 60% did that activity. So this is showing how the conversion rate of that part of the funnel is getting better. That's the idea. So it's not just your overall conversion rate end to end. It's how many converted to get to stage X. That's, that's what this uh, diagram lets you see. Um, and this, so this is the first graph that actually hit home for me and what, what got me turned on to cohort analysis, which is funny because this is really boring as a graph. But, uh, and it's like just a Google Docs spreadsheet. Um, uh, this is from uh, Kara.io, a post they did. Um, so what this is doing, it's taking that dramatic rendering and it's actually putting on a, a, a bar chart. Uh, here are the least important states at the bottom. The most important state is the top, the green one. Uh, it's normalized to 100%, so the amount of sales doesn't matter. It's the percentage within that. You can think of this as a vertical pie chart, where each uh, X position is another pie chart in a vertical bar. And so what this shows you, just at a quick glance, is, hey, look, the number of people who got to the embedded state is increasing over time. My funnel's getting better. My conversion rate to the embedded state is improving. That's great. But it also says that even though that happened, not more, uh, more users are not getting to active, and fewer are getting to deactive as a percentage of the total. So this shows you where people are stalling in your funnel. That's what this, that's what this shows. And, that's, and that's, why, that's why this visualization hit home with me, because I was, I was trying to understand, hey, users are creating a survey question, but they're not buying it. Why not? They got so far in our funnel. They understand our value. They created, you know, they created a question, but they didn't choose to purchase it. Why not? Is it education materials? Is it the fact that the price is too high? Is it, you know, like, is it because they don't know what to expect once they buy it? You know? There's so many little things. Uh, and here's another example of a, a bar chart. Um, and in this case, uh, this is like a sick one. That's how the, guy, the author of this blog post referred to it. Um, this is one where things are just getting worse all the time. So it's like, you know, so the users who signed up a long time ago they use the service and embedded it, but new users who are signed up aren't retained. They're not, they're not staying far in your funnel. Um, oh, and one, so one important thing I, I, didn't, I didn't make really clear here, the x-axis is cohorts. It's when the user signed up. So the user counts only in one x part, that's their birthday, uh, and then only in one vertical bucket. They go in one place. Uh, and what that means is that over time, let's say that you had a bunch of users signed up in the beginning, and then like, a year later or six months later, you email them and say, hey, come and check out my service again. Like, this is why Twitter sends you an email that's like, check out these tweets from your friends. They're trying to reactivate you. That's what they're trying to do. They're trying to get you to come back to the service to progress further in the funnel to increase the retention rate of users who signed up a long time ago. And so what would happen in that case is you would see this drop. They would see more users who are older will actually get further on in the funnel. So you can actually take screenshots or like save pictures of your cohort analysis, and it will change over time as you've done marketing campaigns to reactivate old users, which is not obvious. Um, some problems. You can't see the absolute improvement. You can't cluster spatially. So things that are local to each other don't, you know, they, uh, um, it's not like the transistor graph that can cluster spatially, even though they're not connected in time. Uh, and you really can't read retention from this. You can only get funnel progression. Uh, so here's another graph. This is another stack bar chart graph. Uh, again, cohorts are cohort one, two, three, four, uh, going to the right in time. Um, this one is actually measuring uh, experience in a doctor's office. And this is the amount of time the user spent waiting at each phase of the doctor's office. This is a little bit non-standard, but it kind of shows you 
the types of things you can do with cohort analysis. You can do this with latency. You can do this with time to purchase. There's a lot of things you can do. Um, this one is less mutually exclusive. I don't want to go into all the details here. But anyway, they can show here that the absolute number, you don't have to actually normalize the graph. That's all I'm trying to say here. You can actually show the absolute number, and you can show, hey, look, we have fewer customers over time, or we have more customers over time, or we have people waiting less time over time uh, improving. Um, and again, these are those vertical pie charts, essentially. That's what each one of these bars is. Uh, the problem is you can't see the state changes. You can't do apples to apples comparisons. Like if I wanted to tell you how much orange has changed over time as a ratio of the whole or relative to each other, it's almost impossible. Um, so that's why normalizing is important. So you can do apples to apples comparisons. Um, so you just can't accurately see how one state changes over time or how the ratios between the states change over time. Yes? So the, the question is, um, do the bars correspond to, um, uh, to the full experience over time, or is it just the time when that user, uh, uh, just, just for the, during that duration? It's up to you. Both are actually very valuable. I find that having each bar correspond to the full experience of the user over the entire history of time is the best way to do it. So that cohort, it's a, it's a good question. So that cohort should be, this was their experience using your product ever. Um, you can break it down, though. You can say, you can like reset it and say, OK, show me three-month cohorts. You know? So here's the experience of all my users from when they signed up over the last three months. You can slice it that way. That's like slicing it in the time dimension. Uh, by the time you get there, that's pretty sophisticated, and that's great if you can do that. Um, OK, can we go back to the questions real quick? I just want to make sure that anyone has it, and then I'm going to do a, a quick demo of, of kind of the tool I built. No more questions still. OK, awesome. That means I'm either making sense or no one is paying attention, uh, <laughs> which is great. Um, OK, so Cohort Visualizer is this tool I built. Um, and it was because I had done most of my analysis in Excel uh, and or Google Spreadsheets. And it was just falling apart. I had too many rows, too many columns. I wanted to do a bunch of things that were really hard to actually accomplish in Excel uh, without having to create, do all kinds of scripting. And I'm like, you know what? I might as well just write this in code. Um, and so I'm going to demo this now. Um, uh, let's see if I can just do this. Yeah, look at that. OK. So this is it. Um, is that going to go away? Yes. OK, so this is Cohort Visualizer. Oh, no. I clicked on the button, which, oh, yeah, it's still there. Cool. OK. All right, so this is, this is the Cohort Visualizer. This is the tool I built. Um, I'm on a tiny screen here, so it's usually bigger than this if you increase the size of your screen. Uh, the x-axis is time. Uh, the users go in the bin of their birthday. Here it's by day. Uh, you could toggle this and say, like, oh, actually group them by week or group them by month. Uh, and then users count in only one state on the state of their birthday in the section of their birthday. Uh, this is the non-normalized graph, so you can see how it changes over time. Uh, or you can normalize it. And now you can do an apples to apples comparison. Uh, so a couple things stand out here. Um, First of all, there's this big spike right here. What happened? Um, so I'm, I'm going through a fake um, social network kind of situation. Um, there's a lot of controls here. I, I, I can explain them later. It doesn't really matter that much. Um, but let's say the states here are the user was born in blue, uh, dark blue. They updated their profile in light, in light blue. Uh, they sent their first message. They unlocked their first achievement. Like Let's say this is like a four square check-in kind of thing. Uh, and then like, they made some posts or Yelp or something, and they made some posts about their experiences. So what matters to me the most is people creating content, user-generated content. That's what I have, the green zone here. Um, and, you know, and so this is modeling my funnel. Um, and so using this tool, I can see, OK, 10% of them were born uh, in, this, in this vertical line. So you can see it's, uh, this corresponds to uh, November 19th, uh, 2012. That's this, that's this vertical bar. For users born that time, here's how many were, got to being born and never got any further. And then uh, here's how many updated the profile but never got any further. Uh, and here's how many sent a first message and never got any further. So that's what this is visualizing. On the right, there's like a whole bunch of different calculations and summations for actually pulling that data out. Um, so I can read right here that how many users um, sent a first message and less. Uh, and it's some down and some top and bottom. It's 30%. I can just read that off. Um, and so it's kind of like a lot of data here, but you, don't, you can just slowly process what you want to process when you're looking at this. Uh, so 
So you can see we have a pretty good progression of our funnel. It changes over time. Our product's increasing. We have more customers. These are users. These are the number of new users we have every week. That's what this is depicting. Um, and you can see this week something happened. There's this huge bump. We got a bunch more users. If you go back to daily, you can see it's kind of like there's this like traffic spike. Uh, and what's interesting is the traffic spike is mostly in this light orange. So what's that? What is, what's going on? Um, and if we normalize it, what's also interesting is you can see the apples to apples comparison da uh, daily. And real cohort data kind of looks like this. It's very noisy. Um, day of the week ha has a huge effect on your users, uh, depending on what you're doing. Um, and so, so here's maybe the time that I was getting a homepage, homepage promotion or something like that, or my app was on the App Store featured or who knows what. I had a bunch of users signing up for the service, um, but they're all getting stuck in this unlocked first achievement. So even though they got really far in my funnel, they're not converting to the thing that is most valuable to me, which is making two posts or whatever. So the, so that's, so the cohort analysis immediately just shows you that. You're like, wow, look at these users. Uh, my product failed them here. It did not convince them that they should go any further. Um, the thing that's also really interesting is um, you can correlate that to a spike. So you're like, oh yeah, when was my traffic spike from the homepage promo? Okay, it was, here it was, right? And then what were those users like? Well, those users converted differently than my normal users. So you can actually, you can actually look at um, the cohort data for just, uh, you can see how the cohort data changes in the actual ratios between the states. Uh, and that's, that's, again, what this normalized view is, is showing you. Um, so one of the things I had said, uh, a goal of uh, what I want you to take away today was saying, segmenting your users, users is very important. This graph kind of highlights why. Um, in this case, uh, we're only talking about, we're looking at like an, an average, okay? And we're seeing our average conversion rate got worse during this promotion period. But did it affect all users? Or was it only users who came from the promotion? Uh, if you could segment your users into two cohort graphs, then that would let you actually figure that out and see what that is. Um, so in order to do that, um, there's a tool down, there's a, there's a little feature in this thing, which is, um, you know, you could do it by sign up refer or the favorite feature of the user. Um, and you can say, oh, you know what, show me only users who have, who have used chat a lot. And it'll actually pull out just the users who use the chat feature. So it's a regrouping. And so now you can segment the data and say, oh yeah, look, the users who use chat, they're the ones who actually converted at a lower rate. Everyone else continued to convert at a high rate. Uh, isn't that great? So you really have to play with this tool to understand like, all the depth of it. Um, but uh, the idea is that you can segment and filter and regroup um, uh, uh, all the different things you want to do. Uh, another thing is, if you just want to answer the question, like, how many users have I ever had over all time? Uh, you can get a cumulative graph. And so you can, just, uh, you can just watch this count up. And so you can see, oh yes, I've had you know, a million users, and 21% uh, of my users over all time have made two posts. I can see my growth rate is as a graph here. I can see my growth rate increase during this, this uh, peak period. Um, so, that's, so that's like a nice uh, cumulative part of this. Uh, one other thing that you might notice on this graph is right here. Um, I'm going to show it as normalized. There's this drop. This dark blue line gets smaller. So it consistently happened. This is what launching a feature looks like in cohort analysis. So if you launch a feature and it changes the way your pipeline works, if you, change, if you got rid of a link that everyone was getting to your product with, this is how it will show up. Some day will come along, and then your funnel, its ratios and total accounts will change. Um, and so this is, I've seen things just like this, where either something has dropped or it's gotten bigger. Uh, and, and this is what you're going for. This is, this is actually the goal. So let's say you didn't want people to get stuck on the born state. You want them to get further along. Well, this is a good thing. The fact that the blue got smaller is good. Uh, but it's only good if it also meant that more people got further along. In this case, fewer people are getting stuck in the born state, but they didn't go further along in the funnel, right? Like what you'd want is more users that are getting further along. Uh, and in this case, it's just fewer users signing up at all, which is a bad thing. So, you know, when you start playing with this data, you can really see that kind of stuff. Um, the other question you can answer is, you can actually turn off some of these layers. So if you want to say, well, I want to compensate for the fact that users are born at a different, oh, cool. Are there examples of cohorts that aren't grouped? Okay, I have a question. So are there examples of cohorts that aren't grouped by a time period, but by another grouping such as user type? Yes. So. I think that, uh, in my experience so far, um, the, uh, the groupings are the segments. 
the, the segments of your users. You still do cohorts by time, but then you segment your users based on users who, uh, like Android versus iPhone, kind of, that, that would be two different segments. And the way I would think about that is, is here, there's filtering. So you can say like, oh, show just my, so for instance, you can turn off, in this tool you can turn off, and so in this case it's just chat, but let's say it said, okay, iPhone users. Uh, actually, can you project the, the thing again? I'm sorry, I'm demoing something that's not on the screen. Cool, okay, so, so there's these filters right here, this included group values. Um, and so you, could, you can segment, you can say, okay, show me only the iPhone users, so that, that could be instead of chat. Or you could say, show me iPhone and Android together, or show me just Android. That would be an example of segmenting the users to show how they behave differently. Um, or you can show them, you can check all the boxes and show them how they all work as a group as an average. Um, this tool is trying to make that easy. I was rebuilding that in Excel over and over again. I'm like, this is so stupid. Um, that was a big part of why I built this. Um, uh, yeah, so I think that answers that question. Um, okay, I want to show another. Want to show another visualization? Um, okay, this one's the layer cake. It looks a lot like the layer cake. Um, I'm going to explain this one pretty quickly. Uh, but the idea here is the color of the user is the month that they joined. Uh, and then what we're counting here is the day that they quit your service, churn. So this is a churn graph. So the blue guys, the dark blue guys, some of them, they all joined nine months ago, month nine. Uh, some of them quit immediately. Some of them took a long time to quit. Some of them are still quitting now. So, that's, so when they churn, they're no longer retained. So this is a graph of churn. Uh, during our promotion that we had, our product promo, uh, we had a big spike in users, but they all churned immediately. You can see that right here. Um, you can see, if you look at the verticals, you can see what percentage of your, so if, let me go to weekly. Um, so you can see right here on, on this week, the, like a recent week, I can see, oh yeah, of the users who quit this week, 80% um, uh, of them are old users. So am I, are, are the people who are churning on me, are they old or are they new? You can, you can pull that out by looking at the graph. Um, and what's interesting is that churn is, again, the most important thing uh, for, for measuring retention. Retention is actually just a mathematical function on top of churn. Measuring churn is actually the most important part. So I'm going to turn this graph into a retention graph to make a triangle chart real quick. This is kind of the, the big thing. Um, if you click on cumulative and then group by month, this is a retention graph. That's all it's saying. It's, so I'm going to explain that. But what is churn? Churn is how many of my users are still using the product. That's, what, that's all the that churn is. OK? So if you take a certain day, uh, so that's all that retention is, sorry. So retention is how many of my users are still using the product on this day. So another way to say that is how many of my users have not churned yet? That's all retention is. So if you take a point, Everyone who turned to the left is no longer retained. Everyone who's to the right uh, is continuing to be retained from that day on. And so if you just make this graph cumulative, it just pops out. So uh, for instance, here's month seven. Um, the bottom right corner, there's one, one minus x uh, over max across. That means that my first month retention is 72%. My second is um, 54. My third is 38. My fourth is 24. My fifth is 13. You can just read a triangle graph right off of this. That's where it is. You just do this for each color. Here's this next one, 86%, 63, 42. I'm reading from down here, this is X, this X max. 63, 42, 24, 10. Okay, that's all it is. So retention is just like a summation of churn. That's it, that's all it is. Um, and then you can segment that. You can say, hey, how quickly do my iPhone users churn versus my Android users, and so on. You can, you can dive into that if it actually makes a difference by refiltering it uh, and pivoting. Um, and then you can account for things. So one of the big problems that we had was we had this huge spike in, say, users, where this promotion like, totally screwed things up. Well, I want to look at churn, but only for users who didn't use that promotion. That's something you need to do. So this tool will let you do that also. OK, so that's a lot of demo. Um, 
I want to have enough questions at the end. Uh, I really encourage you to just like take this thing for a spin because once you actually play with it, you'll understand what it, like how it works. Uh, I put in the slides again some graphs and some notes so you can come back to this and look at it again. If you have any questions, just email me and I would love to answer them because I am trying to write a help manual right now where it's like I want to do X. How do I do it? I'm writing this manual and uh, I'm hoping to have it out in the next week or so. And so any questions you have would be very helpful to me so I can make that even easier to understand. But again, uh, here are the graphs we just went through. Uh, when it's proportional, you can see spikes and you can see drops. When it's cumulative, you can see the total number of users you have, how often you've doubled, what your growth rate is. When it's normalized, you can see how conversion rate changes at each phase in the funnel. And you can see how product changes have actually caused um, uh, the, the funnel's uh, conversion rates to change with drops. Uh, you can measure churn. Uh, you can measure retention as a summation of churn. Uh, and then the last one you can do is layer cake. Uh, this is an advanced one. I'm not going to really dive too deep into this one, but uh, this is like monthly active users. How many monthly active users did I have in that day? Turns out it's just another operation on the same data. You count, you count the user as alive on the day that they join your service, one. You count them as negative one on the day they left, they turned. And if you just sum that up, this is what you get. You get a layer cake. And you can see, here's how many of my users are still uh, active. Here's how many aren't active. Here, that's changing over time. And then the color is when they sign up to your service. So you can see, oh, maybe these green users really liked your service and they don't churn. What did, they, what did you do there? Why, why did they stick around? You know, what was different about those users? Those are the questions you can answer. Um, so common patterns, this is back to the, someone's question, which is, you know, uh, do you find yourself doing cohorts by other dimensions? Yes, filtering and regrouping happens all the time. That's what this tool is trying to make it easy to do. Um, you show your customer, you know, say you wanted to show customers referred by Tumblr and Twitter, but not by search. You just can check and uncheck some boxes and do that. The other thing is rebasing. Um, so if you wanted to, uh, if you wanted to, if you wanted to uh, compensate for one of these things, you can actually turn off something. So let's say if I wanted to rebase, I can turn off blue. So I can, I can say, I can do a breakdown and say, oh yeah, just show me the breakdown between unlocked first achievement and made two posts. Has that changed? So that's like changing the pie chart or truncating, renormalizing the pie chart. You can do that. Um, the data format is ridiculously simple. I'm not even going to go over the top part. I'm just going to go down to the bottom here. Uh, oh, maybe I won't. It's the type of data, the value of that data, the, the cohort day, and then the states. They signed up, they pro have a profile, they messaged. You just put the count. So if you have an SQL database, this is like, one query. It's very simple. Um, the type is the type of segment you're talking about. So it could be refer, Twitter, and search. It could be uh, users who used a coupon at a certain event or not. Um, it can be any segment you could possibly think of, and those show up as radio buttons in the UI. So what I do for our product is I just dump every single different type of slice and dice I can think of for our product into this one CSV file, uh, and that's it. And then all you do is I literally paste it in here and then click Visualize My Data. It's all done client-side, just in JavaScript, uh, using D3. That's it. Like, um, I wrote a, a simulator to actually simulate these traffic graphs, and like, this, is, this is what comes out of it. It's just like this big CSV file. Uh, and that's it. Um, OK, almost at the end here. Uh, trying to make this big again. OK, so real quick, how do we use this on the Google Consumer Surveys team? I just wanted to give you like a range of things that we can do with cohort analysis. You really need to go into your own data to understand how to pull this out and what matters to you, again. Um, but here's how we use cohort analysis. So active customers um, using different models of churn, seven day churn, 30 day churn, 90 day churn. We do the funnel state progression. How far are my users getting into conversion and how's that changing over time? How have new features changed the way that users convert? Uh, we actually measure our inventory, supply and demand. Uh, we have People answering questions and people buying questions. And we, we actually measure supply and demand using cohorts. Um, average time to survey completion. So you don't have to do cohorts with just people. You can do it with products. So for us, uh, if you bought a survey this month, maybe it would take you seven days. If you bought it two months ago, maybe it would have taken 10 days. So we can actually use the birthday of the product we're selling to measure the customer experience over time. So cohorts don't have to just be for people. It could be for the product you sold, the experience of the user on that day or the experience of the, of the product on that day. Uh, we can measure lifetime user value. So instead of just retention, you can do retained value. You can say, like, how, many, how much 
the users who are retained, how much are they worth? Um, and then you can, you can break it down and segment it. So you can say, how's the retention by uh, repeat buyers versus first time buyers? Um, how much is it worth? Um, how, how, does, how, the, how does marketing affect retention? So users who came through a referral on the social network are retained at a higher rate than those who organically discovered it through search. We can, we can measure that. Um, I can show you total sales by uh, first marketing interaction. I can show you sales by question type or country, et cetera, et cetera. So every slice and dice you can possibly think of, it's all the same simple CSV format. You just paste it in here. Um, so it's pretty cool that with such a simple data format, you can actually have a level of expressiveness to analyze all of these different metrics that might matter to you. Uh, okay, questions. Let's go back to questions. I, know I took a little bit more time than I was hoping, but someone's typing, that's great. Um, how do you factor in reactivation? That's the question. So, so reactivation, um, the idea of reactivation is you find a user that hasn't been active for a while, and then you send them an email or whatever, get, them, get the friend to poke them, and then they come back to your service. Uh, the way I've seen this done is you take a screenshot of your cohort analysis today, then 30 days later, you do your reactivation, you take another screenshot, and then you compare, and you can look, oh look, my users from six months ago, this is how their funnels change. Look how many of them are further in the funnel. Um, so, that's, so you can compare these two graphs on top of each other, and you can actually do that's how you can measure reactivation. Um, if you're actually doing SQL queries from event, from a, like an event database or something like that, like you can just pretend like future events didn't happen. So you can compute your cohort analysis up to some day and then spit out the chart. And then you can compute your cohort analysis all the way to the end and then spit out your chart and then compare those two. Um, so that's, that's how I would measure reactivation. Uh, another, another way you could do it is you could actually make that user be a separate segment. So you can make a cohort type be type of reactivation, and then segment all of your data by reactivation. So you can say here are non-reactivated users and here are reactivated users. Uh, what are your thoughts on tools like Mixpanel? Yeah, I think, I think Mixpanel is pretty cool. RJ Metrics is pretty cool. I find that a lot of the graphs um, that they generate are, are kind of opaque, um, and it's just a lot of percentages on a, on, in a table. They have some uh, charts like here's your retention, and it's going up and down, and it looks like this. The problem that I've found is that uh, the all the metrics that we have are so tied to what's happening right now, like the product promos we're doing or you know, the conference that we're speaking at, that those charts of trends haven't really made much of a difference over time. So I think Mixpanel might be better for established businesses or established uh, products that actually have an expectation of their trends. And our product doesn't. You know, people are learning about surveys for the first time. And so you know, things are constantly changing. And so we haven't been able to pull out a consistent trend. Um, but I think it's still useful. If you think your, your traffic is going to be consistent, you should definitely try Mixpanel. Um, also, Google Analytics can't do cohort analysis at all. It's so complicated to even attempt to do it, which is amazing to me. Uh, so you, can't, you can do it with like, custom segments in this really weird way. Justin Catroni has like, a site that tells you how to do it. And it's still really complicated. Um, so I, I, I suggest trying to do your analysis based on your actual database of records and user interactions. Um, I think that's a better use of your time. Uh, OK, I don't think we have any more questions. Rick, I got two more. If you want to go back to the slides, then I'll be done. Um, uh, cool. OK, so yeah, again, three things. Find the metrics that matter. Take action to measure your impact. Segment your customers as much as you possibly can. Um, cohort Visualizer, it's here, it's on GitHub. Patches are welcome, it's Apache 2.0. Uh, it's hosted right there, and then the source code, you can just click on it. It's, it's JavaScript, it's D3, and CSV, that's it. Um, for advanced use cases, I, do, I actually do all of our cohort analysis using a multi-stage MapReduce pipeline, um, which is pretty fun. Uh, I explain how to do that, so if you're into that, you should check this out. Um, but if you have an SQL database, then queries should get you most of what you need. And then Google Consumer Surveys is my day job um, to check out the, my project, what, else, what I do. Um, these slides, NB3, capital K, capital Y. So if you want to get these slides and read through them, I have notes in there. So please ask me questions if I didn't make any sense, because I'd like this document to kind of live on. 
Uh, and thanks a lot. That's it. So as I walk to the front of the room here, um, this will be familiar to those of you who've uh, attended these workshops. First of all, thank you to Brett. Um, I, I, I love this tool. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think of ways I've got data that I can start plugging into it. Um, one of the ones I'm going to be most interested in is engagement with Startup Lab by when you enter the portfolio, right? which makes a ton of sense. Right? We've now got a lot of data. We've been doing these workshops for about 18 months. Um, this is like a no-brainer, but I'm going to start playing with that this afternoon. So um, you'll see a feedback form in your inbox. Please take a few minutes. shouldn't take more than one or two minutes. Um, uh, let us know, are, are we hitting the mark, missing the mark? What could we do better? What's the best takeaway? Um, I, I should let you know one of the things that uh, our marketing communications team are always looking for are great stories to tell. So, you know, great example from this is if this tool unlocked some insight into your user base, your uh, feature set that you didn't have before that helped you understand, man, we got to double down on this feature or wow, we thought this feature was actually helping us, it's killing us, we gotta, we gotta get rid of it. Um, those sorts of stories are great to help us tell your story, right? It, it helps reinforce the value that Startup Lab in general is adding, but it's really about getting you out in front of uh, potential audiences, and uh, we, we love to help tell those stories. So always be, feel free to reach out to me, um, but, but specifically in the feedback form, uh, please do uh, let us know how we're doing. Um, the data really does matter. It shouldn't surprise any of you that we're fairly data-driven um, when it comes to these things. Um, we're taking next week off. We don't have any workshops scheduled as of right now. If anything drops, we'll make sure to announce it on the list. Um, but do have quite a few scheduled uh, into March, so you'll start seeing announcements for those coming out in the next week or so. Um, and if you have any ideas, topics you'd like to see us cover, uh, subjects you want us to dive into a little bit more, uh, by all means, that's, that's what I'm here for. Uh, happy to help. Um, so thank you. This was the fourth event this week at the Startup Lab. Um, they're not normally quite this busy, but uh, very, very glad you were able to make it out. Those of you who are watching online, thanks for joining us as well, and we'll see you again sometime soon. Thanks, guys.